what we're going to first start out with, as is the typical format, is that Sarah is going to give an uh, eight-minute talk, um, and I really appreciate her keeping to time with this. And then we will have a short period of time for Q&A for Dr. Roberts, um, and that's actually just two minutes. Um, and then after that, Sarah will introduce Dr. Hillier, and then we will have that talk for 35 minutes and then end with questions for Sharon. So um, thank you so much, Sarah, for being our ESI of the day, and please proceed. You can share your own slides. Great, uh, thank you so much. Give me a minute to just share my screen. All right, can you all see? Yes. Okay. Um, bear with me for another minute, if I can. All right. So good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And thank you to the CIFAR for the opportunity to present our work on a pilot cluster randomized trial of an intervention to increase PrEP use among women at risk of intimate partner violence in Kenya. It's really an honor to present on behalf of my co-authors both at RTI and our partners at Impact Research and Development Organization in Kenya. And I'd like to thank our participants, Youth Advisory Board, and our funders at NIMH for making the work possible. So adolescent girls and young women face challenges to PrEP use in Kenya and throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, as illustrated by the graph on the right that shows a steep decline in PrEP retention over a one-year period in a Kenyan demonstration project. Intimate partner violence and relationship inequity are known to be highly prevalent in the region. And women who experience these conditions have higher HIV incidence than their peers, so they're especially in need of HIV prevention interventions. However, they also have lower PrEP adherence, suggesting they may face unique barriers to its use. There's a clear need for interventions to address these co-endemic conditions and support PrEP use among young women at risk of IPV, but few such interventions have been tested or found effective. In the current study, we conducted formative research to understand multi-level barriers and facilitators to PrEP use that were related to IPV. And we then engaged youth and service providers to develop and pretest an intervention to address those barriers. The final intervention, which was called Tuwashindina PrEP, or We Are Winners with PrEP, includes three components delivered over six months. PrEP support clubs for young women, community sensitization about PrEP targeted towards male partners, and PrEP education for couples offered as part of a community health fair event called a Buddy Day. This intervention was then pilot tested to assess feasibility and acceptability, safety, and preliminary evidence of effect. All research phases took place in Siaya County in Western Kenya, which has the second highest HIV incidence in the country. The study was nested within the DREAMS initiative, which delivers PrEP to young women along with many other services. And our goal was to make the intervention easily integrated and sustained within DREAMS by having supplemental activities that could be delivered by DREAMS staff. The formative research and intervention design process have been presented previously and unfortunately don't have to describe them today, but you can see from the photos that they were highly collaborative and also a lot of fun. So I'll focus on the pilot evaluation, which used a cluster randomized design. We worked in six dream safe spaces, which were selected and pair matched based on geographic setting, number of girls enrolled, and the proportion on PrEP. Within each pair, one safe space was randomized to the intervention arm, where participants received usual dreams activities plus the intervention components. In the other, um, the other safe space was randomized to the control arm, which received usual dreams activities alone. Study eligibility criteria are shown on the slide, and I'll highlight that participants could either be using PrEP already or eligible for PrEP based on their own self-assessment of their HIV risk. We collected data at enrollment and month six with an additional safety check at month three to more closely monitor violence. Uh, violence was measured with a validated instrument, and we focused on reportable events, which were either those that were severe or those that occurred more than once in the past three months. PrEP uptake was measured by self-report, and adherence was measured through Wise Pillow electronic monitoring devices. Today, I'll report on the safety and preliminary effectiveness outcomes. Uh, to determine whether the intervention affected violence, we compared by arm the number of reportable episodes per person during the study period and the number of episodes that resulted in physical injury as an indicator of severity. 
For PrEP uptake, we compared the proportion of, in, of participants who initiated PrEP during follow-up in each arm among those who were not already on PrEP at enrollment. PrEP adherence was defined by the number and proportion of days with a WISE pill opening, and we compared the proportion of participants with over 85% adherence during the period of PrEP use in each arm, as well as a continuous measure of the number of days adherent over the period of use. We enrolled 100 participants who had a median age of 22 years. 33% were currently taking PrEP, 60% had experienced IPV in their lifetime, and 45% had experienced it in the past three months. And the two study arms were well balanced on these key characteristics. Retention was 97% at study exit and similar by arm. The support clubs and buddy days were all delivered as planned, but only four to six community sensitization activities were delivered per site, out of our target of 10. All intervention arm participants attended at least one support club with an average of five of eight sessions attended and 90% attended the buddy day, but just 31% reported that their partner had attended a sensitization event to their knowledge. For our IPV outcome, there were 11 reportable IP event, IPV events in the intervention arm compared to 18 in the control arm for an adjusted rate ratio of 0.66. The adjusted rate ratio for IPV resulting in physical injury was 0.2, representing an 80% reduction. These were fairly substantial effect sizes, but they did not reach statistical significance in our small pilot study. Among the 67 young women not using PrEP at enrollment, 52% in, in the intervention arm initiated PrEP during follow-up compared to 24% in the control arm for an adjusted risk ratio of 2.3 and a p-value of 0.01. We were unable to model the binary PrEP adherence outcome as planned because only three participants had adherence levels greater than 85% and all of these were in the intervention arm. For our continuous measure, participants in the intervention arm took PrEP on an average of 25% of the days that they had it compared to 13% in the control arm for an adjusted risk ratio of 1.86 and a p-value of 0.02. Now, during dissemination activities, participants suggested that the observed wise pill adherence rates reflected both a combination of true non-adherence to PrEP and intentional non-use of the wise pill device. Some participants explained that they preferred to use the, pill, uh, the bottles that the pills came in, either because they mistrusted the device, they had concerns about partner opposition or interference to the device, or because they weren't concerned about um, interference or opposition from their partners and therefore were just comfortable using the regular pill bottles, which of course reflected a misunderstanding of the purpose of the wise pill. But in conclusion, the Tuish India intervention was safe and shows promise in presenting, uh, promoting PrEP uptake and adherence among young women without concomitant increases in IPV. However, adherence was still suboptimal among intervention arm participants. So further research is needed to determine whether the observed gains actually translate to increases in the proportion of young women with protective levels of PrEP adherence, as well as to confirm the potential for the intervention to reduce IPV risk. We collected extensive data on feasibility and acceptability in the pilot study, which we will present over the coming months. Um, but from this presentation, I've shown you that we achieved very high rates of retention and high coverage of our adherence club and buddy day interventions but we did face some challenges implementing the community sensitization events for male partners. As our next steps, we hope to further evaluate the intervention in a fully powered RCT to test its effectiveness in reducing IPV and increasing PrEP adherence when measured by objective biomarkers. So I will stop there um, and thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to any questions. That was great, and thank you so much for presenting that data, Sarah. Um, we have several questions that are appearing from the audience. Um, I wanted to take the prerogative to just ask that I was impressed by your retention rate uh, of 98 or 100 out of 103, though it sounded like the men um, was harder to pull along later, and that'd be interesting to talk about. Um, Mallory Johnson um, would like to ask the first question. Hey, Sarah, uh, this was great. I, I loved, um, you know, really, uh, it, it sounds like a perfectly executed formative um, <laughs> intervention study. And so it's great to see that come through. What um, I was wondering what some of the 
bigger changes um, do you see as you go forward into the full scale RCT? You you mentioned some of the challenges with the Wise Pill, um, mm -hmm. with Cannibal, and also maybe with the attendance at the community sensitization events, which I wasn't, um, which I know we didn't have time to get into much. But I'm wondering what other what 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 were the big lessons in terms of what you want to change as you go forward to the next phase of this research? Thanks, Mallory. That's a great question. Um, I think with the one of the bigger things, one of the biggest things actually that I think we might change moving forward is exploring how to move this intervention outside of the dreams context, uh, because there, there have been a lot of concerns about dreams not being sustained over time, and we want the intervention to be, uh, we want to be able to show that the intervention can work in another setting or outside of dreams. And I think it's certainly designed to be able to do that. Um, we just, you know, we're sort of leveraging the DREAMS program to, to be more efficient. Um, but that's something that I think we will propose to change in our um, next iteration. And then I think one, one of the things that uh, with the male sensitization, for example, is that um, we didn't, we expected too much of the DREAMS staff in organizing the events. And we realized that we needed more centralized oversight of management of these types of events, um, scheduling them, identifying audiences, and sort of setting up the events um, and then could rely on these dream staff or other similar community staff to do the, the delivery of the information. And then of course with the wise pill, like I said, it clearly didn't work as we had quite intended. And so I think relying on objective, you know, biomarkers of prep use is really the way to go. Um, people are free to raise their hand using the chat. Um, we'll have time for just one more question or you could, um, you know, using that function at the bottom where you raise your hand, or you could just like speak. Um, you could just, you could just uh, unmute yourself and speak. Uh, hey, like Sarah, that would, her, yeah, that, that okay. should I jump in or? Yes, please. Uh, so, <clears throat> it, you know, it sounds like um, a lot of the participants, you know, had some misunderstandings about the, the wise pill device or whatever. Have you thought about what you might do moving forward, transitioning to the next, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, pilot phase you really, you know, figure out how to communicate, you know, its role better and, and uh, make sure that people feel comfortable using it. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, it was quite experimental because WisePill is typically used in a much more supervised setting. And really what we did is we, we gave these participants a WisePill device for three months and we said, you know, please refill it. And, um, you know, when you switch bottles of prep and keep using it. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it worked. It didn't, I mean, I'm not surprised, I guess, that, that there were challenges with it. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, what we're leaning towards doing, truthfully, is just discarding the wise pill in the future and relying on the, the biomarker, which we couldn't afford in the pilot. Um, it would be nice to have the data on patterns of prep use that we might get from wise pill, but without confidence that it's being used as intended, um, that data wouldn't be very reliable. Okay. So um, thank you so much. I think we do need to move on to Dr. Hillier's introduction. So thanks. Uh. Great. Um, okay, well, it's, it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharon Hillier. Uh, her talk is entitled Developing Options to Improve Choices in HIV Prevention. Dr. Hillier is the Richard Sweet Professor of Reproductive Infectious Disease at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and the Director of Reproductive Infectious Disease Research at the Women's Hospital at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Hillier is a microbiologist whose work has shaped critical in of women's health and HIV prevention. She's the principal investigator of the Microbicide Trials Network, or MTN. She leads an international team of investigators and partners at more than 25 clinical research sites, all focused on the evaluation of promising microbicides through clinical trials. In addition, she directs a program of lab research focused on vaginal microorganisms and genital tract infections and on the evaluation of microbicides for STI. She's published over 300 peer reviewed manuscripts and has received numerous awards and honors over the years. I'll highlight two. Uh, in 2009, Dr. Hillier received the Best Award. Sarah, your your uh, your audio is going out a bit. If you could just, I don't know, either speak louder or something, or maybe even turn off your video as you speak. I'm so sorry, but it's no, that's going fine. out. We're missing uh, yeah. really important uh, information. <laughs> I will turn off the video and speak. thank you. Go ahead, um, keep on going. You were saying you were going to highlight two of her awards after yeah. her 300 publications. Okay. Thanks. So she received 
the prestigious Thomas Perrin Award of the American Sexually Transmitted Diseases Association in 2009. And from 2010 to 2013, she served as chair of the NIH Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council. So, and on a personal note, I've had the privilege of working under Dr. Hillier since 2008 as a member of the Microbicides Network research team. And she has been a, an outstanding role model to me and many other aspiring scientists for her strong, compassionate leadership, rigorous scientific evaluation, and truly unwavering dedication to the cause of empowering vulnerable populations with tools to prevent HIV. I wish we were here in person. I wish we were here in person so Dr. Hillier could hear the loud round of applause that we would give her. Um, but please do join me, join me in providing a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Hillier. Thank you so much, Sharon. You can share your screen to start your talk. Thank you. All right, thank you. And thanks for that very warm introduction. I also wish um, that I could be there uh, to join you today. Um, I love San Francisco and I, so many of you are uh, dear friends and colleagues. But I will spend the next 35 minutes or so just um, going over what um, really are uh, some of the things that have been motivating me over the past few years about options and choices. I think um, options are things and choices are decisions. Uh, condom, for example, is a prevention option, but using a condom is a choice, although frequently not a, a choice that women get to make. Options are fixed and choices aren't. An option, in other words, is a noun for a thing and a choice is a noun for your decision. And we're hearing a lot about this right now. Wearing a mask to reduce the spread of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID is an option, but whether or not you decide to wear a mask is a choice. I've been thinking a lot about this as we're thinking about women's suffrage and, and our own uh, ability to make choices. My grandmother, who's pictured here, was born in 1899 and was named Sigurd Bjord, Edvald's daughter. She was born in Iceland, which is why she has such a tongue-tying name, and moved uh, two years of age to the United States. And she figured out uh, as soon as she started first grade that nobody could say Sigurd Bjorg. And so she chose her own name, Bertha, because she had a teacher she liked very much. She went on to graduate from high school in 1917, which was really actually quite remarkable in her community she was the first person to graduate from high school. And remarkably, she was granted the right to vote in 2020 when was the, she was at the age of 21. And she got for the first time the option to cast a vote and make a choice who her leader would be. She went on to attend college, which was incredibly unusual at that time and graduated in 2025. So when we think about that, we think about how my grandmother couldn't make a choice for who her leader would be unless she had the option to vote. It's good to reflect on how we also need to ensure that people have options, people who need prevention choices, so they can, um, can make those choices. This has really been talked about a lot in the field of contraception. Although there are a lot of contraceptives available globally, many family planning settings are simply understaffed or under-resourced. And some types of contraceptives required scope providers for insertion. When we started our, our research about 14 years ago, what we figured out was that across Sub-Saharan Africa, there were mainly two kinds of contraceptives being used, even though many more were available. And those were injectables like Depo-Provera and oral contraceptives. And with limited options, many women chose or choose injectables. And so it's been very interesting to me in the past several years to hear how people misinterpret options and choices. Some people look at the data and say, wow, women really use a lot of Depo-Provera. They must really love it. Or you can say, well, women actually only had two options, oral contraceptives or Depo-Provera, so they chose injectables. Same information, different interpretation. So we decided to do a little kind of a natural experiment about this. 
We reviewed the data in multiple studies, um, HPTN 035, the VOICE trial, the CAPRISA 04 study, the FEMPREP trial, Partners PREP, all of which included lots of women. And we looked at what women were using. What you can see is that in studies where contraception was required, you saw a preponderance of depo and combined oral contraceptives and very few implants and IUDs, which are very commonly used in the United States. So our little experiment was this. We basically said, okay, in the next study we do, the ASPIRE trial, let's make sure that we have at least four contraception op contraceptive options available to every study participants. And we'll just give them standard contraceptive counseling and let's see what happens. And that's shown in this figure. What you can see is depo provera at the screening visit uh, was taken up by about 30% of women. And then when women had their last follow-up visit after a couple of years on the trial, about 30% of women really did love that depo and they stuck with it. Net N is another injectable contraception. You can see about five to 8% of women stuck with that for the course of the study. But I want you to look at how when uh, oral contraceptives could be replaced by things like implants and IUDs. We saw a rapid decline in the use of oral contraceptives and a huge step up in implantable contraceptives to 25% and IUDs to 15%. Importantly, in the far right hand column, what you saw was that when women came to join this study, about almost 30% were using no contraceptives. And at the end of the study, when women didn't have to continue with contraceptives, 95% had a high, highly effective contraceptive. What that means is that offering an array of options changed the patterns of choice that women had. And at the end, many more women were covered by one or more methods. And I think that that natural experiment taught me the power of providing a broader range of options so that women could make effective choices. Now, why am I talking about this? Obviously, deciders, whether they're ministries of health or funders, look at new technologies or new drugs to decide what people need. And it's tempting to just think that you really need one approach or a strategy because it's simpler and cheaper to offer fewer options. But we really have paid too little attention to what happens to people, men and women, who fall through the HIV prevention gaps and what they want and what will work for them. Clearly, oral daily prep is a wonderful intervention. And if people can use that, it's simple, it's highly effective, and it should be used. But as Sarah just taught us in her wonderful study, adherence is a pretty tough uh, thing for many, many people. So when we think about women, um, what kinds of options do they have? We talk about abstinence, often not under the receptive partner's control, condoms, usually controlled by the insertive male partner, circumcision, which is really only for men, knowing whether your partner is positive and virally suppressed, that's good for everyone. Oral prep, Truvada, good for men and women, Descovy, as you all know, that crazy story, only approved for men and trans women. And now we have injectable cabotegravir, which has been proven to be effective in men and trans individuals, not yet approved in either population and no available yet for cis women. So when you look at the list, it's really, there are fewer options, especially for young women. That's important because women, especially young women, account for a large proportion of new infections. In the data that were released this summer with the AIDS 2020 conference, they reminded us that gender-based violence and inequalities continue to drive the HIV epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. Young women and adolescent girls account for one in four new infections, despite making up only 10% of the total population. So we continue to push forward on the idea that one way to expand options is to provide a non-systemic approach for prevention. Why? Because receptive sexual partners have higher vulnerability to HIV, both from vaginal and anal sex. Receptive partners often do not control condom use. 
And microbicides provide a non-systemic way of providing protection at the point of infection. Importantly, we have also heard from um, participants around the world that topical products are seen as less medicalized. They're not ARV treatments. They're more, uh, they're seen as more women's health products or lubes or other kinds of sexual products and therefore actually may be uh, more applicable for people who really have a uh, struggle with the stigma associated with use of systemic ARVs. But our basic tenet has been that providing more options provides better choices, will give us greater coverage and overall more impact. So today I'm gonna to take you through a rapid uh, tour through the topical HIV prevention world. I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time on the vaginal ring. I'm uh, not really gonna talk about some of the work we're doing on these sort of Listerine breath mint strips that are vaginal films um, that can provide, we hope, up to a week of protection. The insert, which can be used vaginally or rectally um, as a microbicide, ARV containing douches, and even ARV containing loops. But I'm going to start first with a few words about the work that was done with tenofovir gel. Like everybody knows that it was a water based gel that had 1% tenofovir, looked great in the monkey models, 100% protected. Several phase one studies uh, showed safety. And then there was the Caprisa trial out of Durban, South Africa, that showed a 39% overall reduction in uh, HIV in women randomized to the tenofovir gel. And among those who used it better, a 50% reduction. But that was quickly met with the results of the second study published by Jeannie Marazzo in the New England Journal of Medicine called the VOICE trial. Now the voice trial, just to remind you, was a huge study. And we, honest to God, thought we had three home runs. Truvada should work, Tenofovir should work, and the vaginal gel should work. We had 5,000 women across 15 sites. And so we had an oral Tenofovir, oral Truvada, vaginal Tenofovir, and then matched placebos. We were absolutely heart sick when we unblinded this study and realized that none of the products reach statistical significance in terms of protective benefit. For reasons we will never understand, oral tenofovir went in the wrong direction entirely. Vaginal tenofovir only had a 15% level of effectiveness. When we looked at um, adherence, we found that although women said they um, used the products and they returned the pill or applicators in a way that suggested there was high levels of adherence, when we looked in the blood, about uh, only less than 30% of the women had any evidence that they had used uh, the tenofovir based products. And then a nice subset study done by Catherine Koss and published in AIDS and Human Retroviruses, we saw that overall using hair samples, about half the women were trying to take the product at least part of the time, but not consistently and not at high enough levels to actually show a protective benefit. Unfortunately, we also found that the people who adhered well to the product tended to be older, married, have their own income, and have already had a child. And these were factors that were also associated with a lower risk of HIV. So the product could work very well, I think, in people who were at lower risk, but obviously was not meeting the needs of the higher risk younger people. Importantly, we went back and looked, well, is topical delivery even going to ever be effective? We knew that Truvada certainly was from the Partners Prep study. And so we went back and tested the samples from women in the Tenofovir gel group who were users compared to non-users. And what we found when we did those analyses that we did see a very strong protective benefit, as was seen with Caprisa, with a, about a 60% reduction in HIV infection in those who actually did use it. So it's really what it was showed me was that topical delivery could work, provide substantial benefit, but the gel use was not going to be the road that was going to get us there. 
We also spent a lot of time talking to women. I know Judy Arbach's on the call today, and we talked a lot about how people interpreted that data. And when we, what we found is that women said, I love getting the free condoms, the contraceptive family planning services are fantastic. I love the counselors. I love it. it's the first time anyone's ever talked to me about intimate partner violence. I really appreciate the high quality STI testing and the cervical cancer screening and the good quality HIV testing. I know I can bring my partner in for testing. You usually give me a meal while I'm here. And then you gave me these study products and you told me these study products may in fact be toxic, that the oral prep could uh, be very damaging to bones and kidneys. I think we probably overdid it on that. And that there was a great deal of uncertainty about whether the products would work. And so what women told us was that the youngest ones were the least able to balance the product list that we put into the consent documents versus the benefits. And we also learned that those waiting rooms were a toxic place where the peers would talk to one another uh, about potential risks and that essentially they started to talk to, talking amongst themselves that they were not sure what they got, if it was a placebo or active, but that you could get everything that was in a study without actually taking the product. You could get all those services, which we clearly told them they could, and that they decided to hedge their bets, put the products in the drawer and not use them. But we also heard there was a significant component of stigma um, because they had a hard time explaining to their parents or their family members or their partner why they were using it. So we learned a lot from that study. When people say voice was a disaster, I think actually voice absolutely transformed how we did research and how we listened to women in terms of what they wanted. As you just heard from Sarah, we're learning that PrEP, although it sounds very easy, that actually voice has predicted some of the difficulties we're seeing in rolling out PrEP for women. And I'm just gonna quickly highlight a, a, a study that was presented by Connie Kellum uh, last year in Mexico City, the HPTN-082 study. And it was really targeting 400 women who said they wanted PrEP at enrollment, and about 200 women who declined PrEP. And these women were enrolled in Johannesburg, Cape Town, South Africa, and in Harare, Zimbabwe. And overall, they found that PrEP uptake was really high, like 90 some percent, almost at all the centers. And then they measured adherence. And what they found was that overall, that good level of adherence was about 25% at three months, 20% at six months, and only 8% at 12 months. It was astonishing, really. So again, I think the voice trial and FemPrep predicted what we were going to see in rollout, that for many young women, they can use it. But for many other young women, this is not an option that's working well for them. So lots of enthusiasm for HIV prevention products, but incredibly low levels of persistence. So now let's talk about rings. The idea of a ring is simple. You essentially have this uh, ring. It's impregnated with antiretroviral drugs. It's put into the vagina and it releases drugs slowly over a month. It's a tiny amount of drug, four milligrams of drug released over a month. There were two phase three studies, the ASPIRE study, which we conducted in the RING trial, and together they enrolled about 4,300 women throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Just to remind you, the RING was developed by the International Partnership for Microbicides through a royalty-free license from Janssen Pharmaceutical who donated the drug to Pivarine. The open label studies have now been completed, and I'll talk a little bit about the regulatory process. So when these data were presented in 2017 from the two trials, it's safe to say, again, we were really sad because their protective benefit did reach statistical significance, but it was modest, only 30%. And in the intention, intention to treat analysis, what we found was that overall, these were extremely safe products, not surprising given the low amount of drug, but that, as I mentioned, 
a really somewhat disappointing level of efficacy. So why do we remain excited about it? Well, the first thing that we noted and published in the New England Journal when we analyzed this was that there was a huge disparity in protective benefit by age. In the intent to treat analysis in women ages 23 to 26, there was a 56% reduction in HIV in those using the dipirin ring. In those 27 to 45, a 51% reduction in HIV incidence. But in the 18 to 21 year olds, there was clearly no benefit. Overall, if you combine all the women over 21 years of age, the HIV protection effectiveness of the ring was 56%. I don't have time to talk about all the modeling work, but when we go back and actually look at who, who used the ring, we believe that um, per sex act effectiveness is something like 75%. It's not 100%, but it's highly effective if used. Well, we moved on to the open label extension studies. And in these studies, what we go back to is essentially offering the product to women who use the, the product in the randomized trial. And this was, uh, there's a typographical error here. It was presented in, uh, I think, 2019 Mexico City meeting. But what we found in this was really uh, an opportunity to look at once women knew they had active product, would they still want the ring and would they use it? And that's shown here. Retention was very high. 98% of all visits were completed. We made a total of 8,436 8, follow-up visits. High retention to a year of follow-up. But to me, the headline of this is persistence. Remind yourself again, the kinds of persistence that we saw with HPTN 082, with persistence of only 25 dwindling down to 8% over a year. With the ring and these 1,300 women, persistence was high. I believe it was something like 80% of women accepted the ring at all of the visits. So importantly, what we saw is that if women are offered the option of using the ring, the vast majority chose the ring and continued to use it throughout the 12 months. And this to me is the headline. It is an imperfect product, but it's easy to use perfectly. And so the protective benefit can be substantial to use daily oral prep. So the regulatory pathway for the ring is, um, is underway. The EMA, there's sort of two pathways that products can go for. There's a submission to the European Medicines Agency in Europe under Article 50, which gives you a pre-qualification from the WHO. It doesn't allow for marketing uh, in the EU, but it provides assurance to low and, medical, low and middle income aid regulators that the product can meet risk benefit standards. Most products that we're familiar with go through the US FDA pathway. And that's important too, because it allows for use in the US and product uh, use with PEPFAR funding. The news that we received on July 24th of this year was that the European Medicines Agency has now provided a positive opinion for the dipivalene vaginal ring. And what that means is that this product can now be approved by regulators in Kenya, and Uganda, South Africa, and other countries. And what we're hearing is that the first approvals could be coming in from Zimbabwe and other countries by mid-2021. So while that regulatory process continues and the Food and Drug Administration submissions are underway, additional research is being uh, undertaken to establish the safety of ring and oral prep in adolescent girls, pregnant and breastfeeding women. And I just want to mention that very briefly. So REACH is a study that's really looking at this notion of how do we attack that problem that we saw in the SPIRE study of young women's non-use of the product. 
we spent a lot of time uh, talking to young women. And what they told us is that as a young um, woman, an 18 year old or a 17 year old, what you really want to think about is how to be attractive and have fun and how to do what I want. And the other things are there in your mind, the concerns about rape and violence, and food and housing insecurity, pregnancy, STIs, and HIV, but HIV is a little bit far down that list. We also heard that when they go to see clinicians, they're saying, you know, you're a young girl, you shouldn't be having sex, but if you do, you have to use condoms, you got to get your contraceptives, and you have to take PrEP. And they really didn't feel as if they were having a say or uh, agency in their own choices. So what we heard young women say is that neetering or PrEP will be right for anyone. And I would argue injectable PrEP won't be right for everyone either but they really resonated with this notion of having choice and that being able to choose products for themselves was incredibly empowering. This is a study that we have now enrolled about 250 young women, about a, uh, 90 or so of those women are 16 to 17 years of age. And unfortunately we had to curtail enrollment early because of COVID. But the bottom line is what we're finding is very high levels of adherence in this study to both products. And in the study, what women get to do is use each product for six months. And then in that third period, they get to pick which one they want. And guess what? Some women really love PrEP. Some women really love the ring. And they really, really love the opportunity to choose. So um, we are getting to a point where we think we will have this study completed uh, later next year. I do want to mention that we are also uh, just launched this last couple of months uh, studies in pregnant and breastfeeding women. These are really important populations because these women are also at very high risk. So just to mention briefly, the Be Protected study is 200 breastfeeding women uh, and their infants who are going to be evaluated. This is enrolling currently in Johannesburg and is open now in uh, Uganda as well. And the DELIVER study, which is a study of 750 pregnant women, which is currently enrolling in both South Africa and Uganda. I do want to mention that lots of women have told us they would love to have something that would protect them from both sexually transmitted diseases and pregnancy. And they, we are looking at um, different ways of co-delivering co-formulating or co-administrating things that would, uh, options that would allow women to protect themselves from both HIV and pregnancy. I want to spend my last couple of minutes saying a few words about rectal microbicides. Um, these are things that might be used on demand at the time of sex. And there are various strategies that are under uh, evaluation, including using antiretroviral drugs and gels as loops, enemas or rectal douches uh, containing ARVs and rectal insert, inserts containing ARV. What we've learned from our studies conducted in the US and uh, in Thailand and Peru is that non-US participants were way more favorable to topical approaches than tablets compared to US participants. But again, Everybody didn't like the same thing. They liked the options. And that's moved us to uh, working on what we are calling behaviorally congruent prevention methods. We know that things like rectal douching within the context of anal sex is really, really common. And so Craig Hendricks at Hopkins um, developed this notion of taking um, this rectal douche and adding tamoxifen to it and essentially seeing whether or not that could actually provide substantial benefit. What he showed was that with a rectal douche, you can get high levels of tamofavir diphosphate in the colonic tissues within three hours, and they persist at 24 hours, even after a single application. And these are levels, as shown in this figure, higher than the levels achieved with oral prep. So there's a lot of enthusiasm about this and really high quality data from animal studies showing high levels of protection with the rectal dish. 
What other products are being evaluated? Uh, essentially, uh, this insert that could be used either vaginally or rectally, suppositories. And we just completed a study that I thought was super interesting in San Francisco, Birmingham, Pittsburgh, but also in Peru, Thailand, South Africa, and Malawi, where we said, like, what, how, what kind of a platform would you like for, for administration of ARVs? And we're just really excited and looking forward to seeing the results. So there's still a lot we don't know. We don't really know if vaginally administrated, uh, administered ARVs will really be attractive or to whom. Uh, we need to understand who will choose the products and will addition of this into the armamentarium of what could be available really increase the total number of women who are protected. Can we mitigate uh, some of the issues related to stigma through use of these topical methods and will they translate to better uptake of the methods and better persistence? Will these multi-purpose technologies be successful as contraceptives? Will it ever be possible to really provide enough protection with rectal application of ARV? Those studies need to continue. And how can we actually address some of the gaps for young MSM transgender men and women who we have included in our study who tell us they want different options? I want to leave you with the notion that paternalism is the enemy of choice. And paternalism, you all know, is the policy or practice on the part of people in positions of authority of restricting the freedom and responsibility of those subordinate to them in their supposed best interest. In healthcare, there are innumerable, innumerable studies that show that shared decision making absolutely increase inclusion of the person involvement lead to improved treatment adherence, improved disease coping, improved quality of life, whereas lack of patient involvement correlates with lower adherence to treatment, patient satisfaction, and health outcomes. We believe that empowering young men and women to make their choices by providing a broader range of options will lead to much greater adherence, persistence, and engagement in care, which we've learned in treatment is really central. So I'm leaving you again with this final note. More options we think will lead to better choices, greater coverage, and a greater impact on the epidemic. I wanna do a special shout out to my many good friends here at UCSF. I wish I could see in person, uh, Monica, Sue Buckwinder, Diane Havler, and Peter Hunt, all of whom I've worked with for several years on the CROI committee. Al Lu, who's uh, been a really important investigator in our uh, MTN studies, but also people on the phone today like Catherine Koss, who worked with us on the hair analyses, Judy Auerbach, and Steve Deeks. It's really been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Um, we can even clap. Um, <laughs> like we, I promise we'll be together later. Um, uh, it looks like we have uh, many questions coming up from the audience. Some of these are applauds and some of these are questions. So I'm gonna just like call on you even if, uh, and you could tell me if they were applauds or questions. I think Pam Murnain has a question. Um, and um, why don't we start with that? Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. I, it was actually an applaud. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Terrific presentation. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay. And um, I mean, I think the uh, obvious question while I'm waiting for, um, oh, it looks like Lillian Brown has a question um, and Karina Marquez. But um, before, I just wanted to ask you really quickly is that, um, uh, everyone, the next question is the European AIDS Commission, as you know, you know approved the Depilrine ring and uh, when are we going to get it? <laughs> like, when are we going to get it uh, here or worldwide? So, uh, uh, the, the word is that it may in fact be approved uh, first in uh, Zimbabwe and they're saying maybe March or April. So basically the, 
the after the EMA approves it, the WHO is having a guidelines meeting, I think in late September, later this month. And then the um, pre-qualification for the ring will be available then by the end of the year or in January. Then in-country regulators can take that opinion to their own regulatory bodies. But that's ongoing and we hope it will be in some countries, like any other drug, it's a country by country thing, but we hope the first one will be in March or April of 2021. I think that's really exciting. And um, Dr. Brown, Lillian Brown, she is a member of our IAB and she had a question for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hillier. I mean, I honestly have mostly applause. That was just such a great presentation of all of the exciting choices for HIV prevention and how important it is to combine both the behavioral research with these biomedical interventions. Um, just a minor question. I was really interested in the rectal applications of um, ARVs for prevention. Um, this is a new area for me and I was wondering how um, do you anticipate those will actually be administered and implemented? Are these like a daily application thing? Are there any um, uh, like long-term, um, more long-term options for the topical applications rectally? Um, yeah, no, I, I think the rectal, uh, the rectal uh, microbicide agenda is about a decade behind the vaginal uh, microbicide agenda that Craig Hendricks really has been stalwart in that. And I, I truly hope, I think everyone knows the MTN will close out at the end of next year. But we are really trying to um, hope that all of these valuable uh, platforms can continue their research and, and find their way into the communities of need. There aren't any uh, long acting topical methods I'm, avail uh, I'm aware of yet in the, in the rectal uh, microbicide agenda. Um, because uh, the way the gut works, you know, things move through pretty quick. So where you can actually do sustained drug delivery in the vagina, it's going to be much more difficult rectally. But I think um, study participants tell us that there's a real interest in having sort of, it's been interesting with oral prep, right? A lot of people use it on demand, not every day as recommended. And I think Diane Handler's prep data that were presented from the search trial show that people kind of decide for themselves when they're in seasons of risk and use it. So I think this notion that people look at their own situation, size up their risk and can make decisions about using things on demand is compelling because even with oral daily prep where it's supposed to be used all the time, it's actually used episodically by many, many people. So I'm still hopeful that that's a strategy that can work for some people. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up, Peter Hunt's going to ask you a question about that, and then we'll go to Sarah Mars. Yeah, yeah I was uh, really struck by the rectal um, uh, microbicide data, too, and it looked like the, um, the slide went by quick, but it looked like the uh, hypoosmolar uh, formulation uh, uh, produced higher uh, uh, tissue levels of tenofovir, but I, I was I was wondering about whether the osmolarity of the enema affected um, epithelial cell barrier function, at least in the in the gut um, in, in the gut biopsy world. Um, uh, the hyperosmolar um, uh, uh, enemas uh, seem to cause more epithelial uh, barrier disruption, which you might you know think might be a negative thing. I wondered right. whether that's another thing that's balanced in these preparations. Yeah, no, thanks so much. And, you know, obviously I was covering a lot of territory really, really fast, but um, the rectal agenda is so interesting. They tested a hyperosmolar, an isoosmolar, and a hypoosmolar, and they found they got better drug penetration and the best safety pro profile with that hypoosmolar, which actually drives the drug into the, the tissue. So. You know, it's not just the ARRV, it's the formulation. And so simple things like changing osmolarity actually has a huge impact on both drug penetration and, uh, and safety. So thank you. So um, Sarah Mars. Thanks so much for a really fascinating presentation with so many different um, uh, findings. Um, and. Um, I was wondering, I had a couple of questions. One is, is the vaginal ring de 
detectable by um, their sexual partner. Um, is that could is that in any way relevant to um, sorry to uh, um, its acceptability? Is it is it evident that the woman is using the vaginal ring during sex? So yeah, so clearly, if you put your fingers, if you were doing digital foreplay, you can absolutely feel the ring, right? It sits high in the vagina, but it's absolutely detectable. But um, many, we've asked that question um, uh, in all of our studies, and young women um, primarily say uh, their partner can't feel it or it doesn't disturb them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's you know, once in a while, um, especially in very, what can I say, in somewhat dysfunctional personal relationships, men don't like anything in the vagina because they feel like that's their space and they don't want it there. So in some cases, women have suffered intimate partner violence and men have forcefully removed the ring. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, it's been one of the things that women who've used the ring a lot have shared with us is that they were so surprised that it was not bothersome to their male partners mm -hmm. and that it didn't disturb their sexual activities at all. Mm. Um, thank you. Uh, I've done a small qualitative study of people who are injecting heroin in West Virginia and um, their perception of HIV risk and their uptake of PrEP. And um, they, um, it, it was men and women and out of all the 26 people interviewed a small number were, well eight were HIV positive but among the rest they were offered prep by the um, needle exchange where they were where they were attending but none of them uh, were interested in taking it even though they were in the middle of an HIV outbreak among their community and um, most of them said that they weren't interested because they didn't see themselves at risk, even though a lot of them talked about all their friends having become HIV positive in the last few months. And um, I was, uh, it sounded like um, some of the people in uh, some of your studies, or some of the young women were um, particularly uh, um, they were more at risk of HIV and yet they saw their risk as lower than some of the people who are less at risk. So yes, yeah, Sarah, no, nobody wants to see themselves as a risky person or somebody at risk. Yeah. And just anecdotally, because I live in Pittsburgh, which is very close to West Virginia, we also have interviewed women uh, with Hep C and who are um, using intravenous drugs and also uh, saying they don't want PrEP and that they don't perceive themselves mm. to be at risk. So, you know, we, I think the, that what we have found is worked better with many people is, uh, you know, sort of this notion of health promotion and things that you can do for yourself. Um, and instead of saying, well, you're a risky person and these things you do put you at risk, we're finding more that you know, you want to be free to um, do the things you want to do, and this can allow you to do that in a healthy way. Mm. And, you know, that's how we have found to be, I've learned a lot from talking to young women uh, and how they feel about the way we've talked to them in the past in a paternalistic way. So, mm. I, you know, it's been um, a real eye opener. I, I thank you for your question because it's, it's a very important issue. Thank you. We had uh, three more questions, but I think in the interest of time, uh, there were many people texting me and saying they want to ask a question. So, but thank you so much, Sharon, for, for this amazing uh, tour through prevention options, your incredible work with women and girls throughout the years. Uh, and uh, I have honestly um, looked to you as a role model. Uh, and it is just a privilege that you came and spoke to us today. So thank you so much. And I will see you on the Croy uh, plotting calls, I'm sure. And everyone wants to applaud. They could do it virtually or whatever. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And it was great to, it was a great honor to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon.